Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elena, and I'm here with my co-moderator, Shannon. And welcome to the second panel in the Social Justice Institute GSA's Just Future series, titled Race, Abolition, and Transformative Justice, featuring Dylan Rodriguez and Leah Lakshmi Pietzna Samarasena. I want to begin with the recognition that our work at UBC takes place on the ancestral, unceded, and stolen territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Beyond acknowledgement, I locate myself as a racialized settler whose scholarship and practice is deeply inspired by and indebted to the work of many indigenous scholars and activists. While we are gathering here virtually today, many of us on indigenous lands across Turtle Island, we encourage everyone to think about what it means for you personally to build better relations to land and support our Indigenous peers, friends, and community members in decolonial efforts. Today's discussion on abolition could not exist without foregrounding how the Canadian state's carceral systems are intertwined with ongoing colonial violence. We created this panel series in response to recent instances of racial profiling, anti-Blackness, and surveillance on UBC's campus, connected with the colonial and carceral state violence that targets Black, Indigenous, and racialized communities in so-called Canada. We hope that this series will spark community conversations around abolition and transformative justice and enable us to apply these radical and generative frameworks to our university campuses. Today's panel will be structured with 45 minutes for our panelist discussion, um, as well as a 15 minute Q&A period at the end um, where anyone can pose a question to our panelists um, using the comment section. Um, let me now introduce our panelists. Dylan Rodriguez is a teacher, scholar, and collaborator who is committed to building and supporting abolitionist, liberationist, anti-colonial, and other forms of radical community and movement. Since 2001, he has maintained a day job as a professor at the University of California, Riverside. He was elected to serve as president of the American Studies Association in, in 2020 to 2021, um, and in 2020 was named the inaugural class of Freedom Scholars. Since the late 1990s, he has participated as a founding member of organizations like Critical Resistance, the Abolition, uh, Abolition Collective, Critical Ethnic Studies Association, Cops Off Campus, Scholars for Social Justice, and Blackness abound, among others. Dylan is the author of three books, most recently, White Reconstruction, Domestic Warfare, and the Logic of Racial Genocide, which won the 2021 Franz Fanon Book Award from the Caribbean Philosophical Association. He was a co-editor of the Field Shaping Text, um, Field Shaping Text, Critical Ethnic Studies, a reader. And most importantly, Dylan appreciates participating in all forms of collective study, thought, and planning that build capacities to survive and revolt against oppressive conditions. Um, now let me introduce our second speaker, our panelist. Leah Lakshmi Pietsma Samarasena is a non-binary femme, disabled writer, and disability and transformative justice movement worker of Berger and Tamil Sri Lankan, Irish and Galician Romani ascent. They are the author or co-editor of nine books, including Beyond Survival, Strategies and Stories from the Transformative Justice Movement, Tongue Breaker, Care work, dreaming disability justice, as well as body map. Um, 
A Lambda Award winner who has been shortlisted for the Publishing Triangle five times, they are the 2020 Jade Cordova Award winner, honoring a lifetime of work documenting the complexities of queer experience and our 2020 Disability Futures Fellow. Raised in Rust Belt, Central Massachusetts and shaped by Toronto and Oakland, they currently make home in South Seattle, Duwamish territories. Welcome to both Leah and Dylan. We're really excited to have both of you on the conversation today. So as Shannon, as we mentioned earlier, this series was conceptualized in response to instances of racial profiling and anti-Blackness on campus, with the goal of imagining what an abolitionist future looks like. With this in mind, we wanted to open by asking both of you, what does a radical abolitionist future look like for you in your work right now? I'll jump right in. Uh, appreciate both of you. I appreciate our interpreter, our sign language interpreter today for doing this work. Um, I'm Dylan, I am use he, him pronouns. I'm, I'm talking to you all from occupied Kawea Tongva land in Southern California, also known as Corona. Uh, my place of work is right down the street from where the Riverside Police Department stole the life of Taisha Miller in 1998, shortly before I started working there. Um, I'm trying to be mindful of our interpreter. I'm going to speak slower um, than, than, I, than I normally do. I'm going to do my best. I might still talk too fast, so I'm, I'm going to count on you all, my facilitators, to slow me down if I, if I start to uh, become inconsiderate of, of our interpreter. Uh, so in response to your question, I'll say that the point of imagining an, abolition, an abolitionist future is for the collective work of shifting the conditions of imagination to happen all the time urgently. This is to say, in other words, that imagination is a collective act. It's not something that really should be posed to individuals. Um, um, I, think, I think it can be posed to individuals as part of collective work. So, so part of what I think has really influenced my sense of what abolitionist futures, plural, plural futures, there's not one, right? Pl future, pl plural futures, what abolitionist futures look like, particularly in response to police presence on campus and anti-Black policing in particular, um, has been the work of cops off campus. Uh, the, both, both the local coalition and the, and the I think, um, increasingly hemispheric movement building work that cops off campus has been doing over the last uh, year and a half. Um, um, I know I know that 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 folks at campuses of all kinds across North America and beyond, from junior colleges to public universities, you know, to elite um, to elite privately endowed private universities that have blood on their hands from the colonial and transatlantic hemispheric chattel project. They, they've all been sites of this form of abolitionist grassroots organizing that seeks at bare minimum to eliminate police presence on campuses. It's within that collective organizing work that I've seen uh, audacious and nonetheless completely feasible forms of abolitionist imagination happening that affect not only the proximity of the campus itself, but also engage in a social imaginary. Um, in other words, it is only within that struggle, that organizing, that urgency, uh, within which that form of imag collective imagination is possible. Um, so I'll say the last thing on this point, which is in, in collaboration with the different communities and collectives that I've been working with both recently and over a long period of time, um, the radical future the radical abolitionist futures mm -hmm. to me seem to be about a state of permanent insurgency. Um, in other words, we cannot understand revolt and insurgency as momentary. I think that they have that these these are these are collective forms of overthrowing the civilization project, with a capital C, the civilization project, that until that is accomplished requires permanent planning for insurgency. I think it's also experimental planning for survival. 
its radical and autonomous versions of sustainability in all its forms uh, in ways that initially survive and at best continually work toward the abolition of things like health, housing, food, and other forms of insecurity. Um, so I'll stop there. I think that's a working answer I would give to that great question. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, thank you for sharing your response um, and pointing us to like the collective and also the multiplicity of abolitionist features. Leah, would you like to take your hand? Oh yeah, I will totally jump in. This is the $6 million question. Um, there's a couple of places I wanna go. Um, what Dylan just shared about bringing up cops on campus. I wanna start by kind of tucking everyone to a specific story that that reminded me of. But first I wanted to say that um, to me, when I think about this question of what the hell is this good abolitionist future that we're gonna make and where are we at making it? Um, I think about the power of the disabled radical imagination and um, I'm going to say it more than once in this talk, the future's disabled. We're not going to get to the, this, the good abolitionist decolonial future without disabled politics, practices, genius, strategies, organizing skills, all of that. Um, and if we ignore the way disability pops up in every single aspect of the monster that we're fighting, disability and ableism, then we're going to lose. Um, we've already lost a lot of battles in movement spaces because abled and allistic radicals have been ableist and have ignored like the big A in the corner. Um, so that's a chunk. Um, I also wanna say that I think that we are in an interregnum mo moment where we're really just kind of like, okay, the rubber's hitting the road. Things are really bad. <laughs> we are being called to scale up. I mean, we were chatting before we went online about being generation X radicals. And I'm like, yeah, I'm 46. I'm, I've been in this struggle for over half my life. I've seen tremendous changes in terms of the scale of movements. I mean, I often say, not that the New York Times is the arbitrator of everything, but I can remember when I was working with Prison News Service in Jim Campbell's living room in Toronto in 1996. And there were maybe, you know, a hundred prison abolitionists in Canada that we knew of, right? And we never would have expected that Miriam Kappa would be on the front page of the New York Times, right? That there would be such a massive scaling up of people buying into the idea of prison abolition and abolition in all its forms. And at the same time, in the last two years, we've seen crisis and we've seen also this pull, both from the state and from us to be like, okay, you really wanna do it? You really wanna replace the cops, the courts, the psych ward? Great, how are you gonna do it? And we are in this moment where we are really being called to practice what we've been talking about and experimenting with on a mass scale when the stakes are really, really high. And I think we're struggling with that for a number of reasons. Um, we want to avoid co-optation. Co you know, it's like, I mean, it's it's a really old trick in the state's book that they're going to be like, we'll throw you a little bit of money and then you'll fail. And then we'll be like, like right now in Seattle, the new mayor's Every day in the Seattle Times, there's another, oh, you know, there's so much criminal activity at the donut shop. We need to refund the police. And I'm like, we didn't even defund it. You know, we had like a year where all the cops quit because there were riots every night and they were like, fuck it, we'll go do something else. Um, I think that there's always been an issue with transformative justice where we've resisted scale because we are like, the things that work are so particular and specific and individual and we don't want to give people easy answers and yet, if we want to create the new world that's coming that we need right now, we need to be able to scale up. And the quick story I was going to tell to illustrate this a little bit goes back to the cops off campus movement. And it made me think about one, how long the struggle to keep cops on campus has been happening. Cause I remember being at York university in Toronto in like, I don't even 2007 where we were like, you not only cops off campus, but cops out of Jane and Finch, like cops out of the black neighborhood that's next door to York. Right, and the struggle against where things I believe are at now where, and this goes back to the imagination too, there's now a police precinct at York. And if you tell some students that that wasn't, there were no cops on campus so pretty recently, they it's hard for them to imagine that that's possible. And I'm like, no, five years ago, it was just fact. And real quick, and then I'll wrap, the story I was thinking about was when um, in 2015, 16, I, briefly was working at the D Center, which is the Disabled and Deaf Student Center and Cultural Center on campus at UW Washington. And I got microaggressioned out. <laughs> but um, one thing that we saw as an issue on campus over and over again was police brutality and surveillance against black indigenous POC students and specifically against BIPOC disabled students. Like 
one of the number one issues that I had was I had so many students who were like, I got tased because the, the cop was like, you look like a school shooter. You're autistic. You look weird. And I want to bring that in just as one example of the like ableism's everywhere, disabilities everywhere. Um, something that disability justice has been screaming from the rafters for forever is that over 50% of police murders of BIPOC people were disabled, autistic, deaf, BIPOC people. If you leave out ableism as a site of struggle, you're not going to win that project. Um, so yeah, and Last up, I mean, I want a future of both abundant care, abundant mutual aid, land back, the end of the state. And I also think that part of the moment we're in where there's a lot of struggle is that we are seeing that mutual aid and autonomous projects are still what is keeping people alive more than the state and everybody's burnt out. Like there is, again, the problem of scale where, um, you know, uh, Redwoods, who runs Mask Oakland, which is this huge organization in Oakland, California, that started distributing masks in the wildfires and continued through COVID-19 when no part of the government was giving out N95s to people. They're like, yeah, every inspiring mutual aid anarchist autonomous project you know of is completely burned out. They're like, we don't have the skills or the ability or the energy or the resources to run the sewage system or to be able to give out air purifiers to everybody in Alameda County, which is millions of people. Um, so I think that we need to keep making demands of the state on holding the state accountable. I think that we have to keep being creative in being really honest about the resources that are needed for autonomous projects. And also, and that includes like holding the grief, the heartbreak and the burnout that we're all going through because we've all, I've lost seven comrades to COVID-19 or medical rationing in the past two years and it's fucking real. I'm gonna stop there. And Dylan wants to add something real quick. I'm fine with it. No, I appreciate I appreciate everything that I was just absorbing from you. Um, and and you and you spurred me once again into just I, I really just want to reemphasize a point that you that you were already making here, which is mm -hmm. uh, I think as soon as the state comes in to fund this shit that we do, like that our folks do, oh. um, it's it's not only time to be suspicious, it's probably time to start strategizing a rejection of it. Mm -hmm. um, try, try, trying to disentangle the work of autonomous mutual aid or what other folks would call autonomous radical collective responsibility, because some people don't like the term mutual aid. Uh, that requires a principled hostility to the involvement of the state. And I'll give you all another example to, to build on what we've already started doing here. And then I'll shut up. Um, Ujima Medics. Ujima Medics, I know I, I, I'd love if, if you all could post the link up for the, for the attendees here um, so they can see it. Ujima Medics, the group based in Chicago, y'all can check it out yourself, but it's mm -hmm. it's a primary, I think, exemplary um, practice that Martin Cabral and Amika Tendahi, the co-founders of it, that they created in response to the anti-blackness of the state emergency response to gunshot, mm -hmm. gunshot wounds and asthma attacks for black people in South in, in, in Southside mm -hmm. Chicago. And, and what they've created is an autonomous emergency life-saving practice among among self-trained autonomously trained emergency workers which is everybody everybody is understood to be a potential emergency worker um and and they, they this this practice has saved countless numbers of lives and and it is framed by martina and amika as a direct kind of offspring of a long black women's caretaking tradition that's inseparable from abolition so i think this is what we're talking about when we talk about uh you know emergency aid for example as, as Martin and Amika have said to me repeatedly, you know, their premise, the premise of Ujima Medics is the understanding that if you are Black and you are in Chicago, the state is not coming to help you, right? So if we work from that as a premise, all our shit changes and even the disposition toward the state changes. Um, so thank you for letting me add that. I think this is a really important question you all raised to start us off. Mm -hmm. Love that. And I just threw um, two different links. Thank you for bringing up Ujima Medics. They're incredible. I just threw in the chat, if someone wants to post it, um, Rep from Minnesota and People's Community Medics, which are two other projects that are really similar in terms of just like the People's Ambulance um, in Minneapolis and Oakland specifically. And I also want to really lift up that Ijeris Dixon, who's my comrade and a Black queer abolitionist and just foundational to TJ practice, has been for years talking about the idea of the people's ambulance. And something they've really raised is, yeah, there's, there's no people's ambulance, but we could build one. And then they've also drawn on their history as someone whose people are Black folks from Louisiana, where they were like, you know, in the South until recently, Black folks had their own 911 and ambulances because the white ambulance would not come out to the Black neighborhood. 
And they're like, it takes work to set that up, but we could do that again. It also takes work to die because, you know, the ambulance doesn't come when you're shot, right? So, um, and I think that all of these are really important parts of the what Shira Hassan has said in terms of decolonizing our imaginations as a part of TJ. I'll shut up now. Well, thank you both so much for both of those insights. I think especially the piece that you're both calling out about um, the difference between like people wanting to move towards reform um, and you know getting that state funding versus a full like embracing of abolition. Um, I think that's something that we've talked about in our GSA as well. And I think it'll come through in, in the next question too. Um, so for the next um, question, we want to specifically ask Dylan um, about your work. Um, so we wanted to ask, um, what does it mean for abolition to be a necessary ethical obligation um, and a praxis of human being? Um, and then secondly, I know these are kind of two separate questions, but I guess we'll just ask them together um, and you can kind of take whichever pieces you'd like. Um, so secondly, um, how do we respond when carceral institutions, um, such as police departments, um, co-opt abolition and trans transformative justice discourses um, for, you know, performative and neoliberal ends? All right, y'all are incredible, first of all, for asking questions that we could actually have a whole seminar, like a 12-week seminar to think through in a rigorous way. So. So I'm I'm supposed to give you a response in less than 10 minutes. I'm gonna be less than that because because we already started talking through the first question like we do with extended time. So I'm gonna just I'm gonna start with takeaway points. All right, like I'm gonna leave out the long narrative um, <laughs> and just start with takeaway points. The first question, okay, what does it mean for abolition to be a necessary ethical obligation as a praxis of human being? The notion of praxis of human being, I need to be really clear with folks um, that are that are that are taking this conversation in that might not already understand that phrase. It comes directly from a book, a conversation between Catherine McKittrick, the great black radical geographer, feminist scholar, mm -hmm. Catherine McKittrick, and um, what I could only call the ethical black radical thinker Sylvia Winter from a conversation that they had, uh, and it's also the title of a book that they that they essentially created together um uh called on on being on 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 being human on being human as praxis so I, it, it comes directly from that the idea of abolition as a praxis of human being so let me start with the negative takeaway points right why why i think it's important to think to begin to frame abolitionist work praxis shared labor in this way one is that there has been a tendency since the uprisings of 2020 for the circulation of the term abolition to uh, unduly limit and collapse it so that it is understood to be a far away destination point mm -hmm. or end point uh, that may or may not be reachable, right? It, it tends to be abstracted from the urgent present tense. And it also really relies on a notion of time of causality that is deeply Western and colonial. OK, whereas to think differently about how I think abolitionist practitioners and abolitionist thinkers and creators and artists and organizers have thought about this since civilization uh, began as a, as, a, as a genocidal colonial project. Uh, it is not a destination point. It is actually an everyday way of uh, creating community. It is a way of understanding the purpose of what one and one's people do. Uh, it's, it's a way of understanding the principles that animate the most mundane things, the seemingly most mundane things, like, for example, the way we understand things like health and housing and education and food security and so forth, right? Um, so, so that's the first point, is that to think about it as human practice means it is no longer a destination or faraway endpoint. It is something that is persistent, constant, and always, right? It is already part of what constitutes the way you think about what you do all the time. So challenging that. The second thing that I think this framing of abolition challenges is this 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 commodification, um, which I think a lot of academics do, but it but it's also part of um, the circulation of the term abolition in the NGO and nonprofit industrial complex, which is the notion of abolition as an identity, right? An identity that is to be claimed and then and then ultimately funded whether it's with a foundation grant, some philanthropic grant or research money. You see it happening all the fucking time. And I will tell you that the vast majority 
of, of, of my scholar colleagues, professional academic type colleagues who are seeking out, who are thirsting out for this abolition type, for this abolition oriented funding, the vast majority are, are not um, ethically or pragmatically connected to communities of abolitionists. In other words, they're not responsible to collectives of abolitionist thinkers, workers, practitioners, even other scholars, right? They, they, that there, there's a tendency to individualize the work and to then claim abolition as, as a kind of neoliberal commodified individual identity. So to frame abolition as ethical obligation, as practice of human being means an exploding of that paradigm. You can no longer claim this as an individual identity. It is, it is at bare minimum, a collective form of identification. Um, interpreter, am I going way too fast? Okay, thank you. Um, the third thing uh, I, I want to challenge is is the way abolition circulates in recent times has has far too frequently abstracted it from the Black radical and revolutionary diasporic traditions. Uh, uh, it, it is it is far. I mean, shoot, even our our, our conversation here somewhat reflects this. Okay, um, not not that one necessarily needs to be of African descent to engage in the conversation, but but I do think that that we have to take care to explicitly frame no, uh, uh, conversations of abolition in, in a direct relation to that diasporic black radical revolutionary tradition. That is the origin point. That is the archive. That is what kind of guides this stuff. So the reason that's important is to challenge the extractive relationship that, that so many activist scholars and others have with that same diasporic black radical and revolutionary tradition. I'll leave that there. We can have a whole conversation about that, but I'll leave that there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as, far, as far as the second part of your question, regarding how to respond when, when, when carceral institutions like police departments co-opt our stuff around abolition and, and transformative justice, I'll, I'll say three quick takeaway points. One, anticipate it, but it, it, assume it, right? We, we have to anticipate and be prepared to detonate, explode <laughs> the imposition of liberal and auto reformist paradigms as they happen in real time. There has to be an unapologetic collective commitment to detonate the imposition of these liberal and auto reformist paradigms. And auto reform is what I mean when that, that's that's what I mean. That's what the state does. It engages in, in oftentimes urgent forms of auto reform. That's what police departments do to avoid getting their fucking stations burned down. Hmm. Let's be real, like to avoid to avoid getting their people. Um, well, I'm, I, I could go further with that. Right. But in terms in terms of in terms of uh, trying to pacify. And, and then domesticate the insurrections against the power of the police. That's what auto reform does. And that's why they steal this shit. And they're good at it, by the way. They study our literature. They re they've, read, they've read our books. They've probably read them more carefully than most of, most of us have. Um, so, so we need to be ready to detonate the way that they do this in real time. The second thing, we have to strategically and militantly, our, I mean, our folks, strategically and militantly be impatient. And we need to be intolerant. Of, of anybody participating in co-optation rituals, exercises, and performances. We must refuse that and also spit on them, right, in the most disrespectful and delegitimating way possible. I'm talking about the way cops, university administrators, and others call these fucking town halls. They call together task forces. They create advisory committees that, that, that pull us, like literally us, those of us that are on this call, probably a bunch of us in the audience, they call us into those conference rooms to engage in these bullshit dialogues and conversations where empty and terrible promises are made about transforming the way they do security on campus or whatever. Uh, and, and what we need to understand is that the whole point of, of, of these rituals is that the counterinsurgency of it, mean, meaning the domestication of it, the domestication of, 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 of abolitionist movement is in our participation. So we have to refuse the participation. The last thing I'll say is that there's another insistence I'm going to make, um, which I hope will spark conversation among folks here in, in, in other places, which is that we must never forget that abolition is also about destruction. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm careful about the ways I say that because I understand that it is really important for folks to understand abolition is about creativity. It's about, you know, my, my, my teacher and mentor Ruthie Gilmore's notion of it has, has circulated very widely and I'm glad about, you know, how abolition is about presence. It's about making things. Abolition is at the same time, it's about destruction. It is about destroying oppressive power relations. It is about destroying oppressive colonial anti-black institutions. It is about both of those things. If we can take that with us, 
into the response to these carceral institutions co-optations, then, then I think we will actually have potentially productive responses that don't get us trapped in the co-optation itself. Thank you so much, Dylan. There was so much there, I think, thinking about how abolition is a praxis of human being, but then also thinking about ways that we as you know graduate students as sort of scholars can actually think about like responding to and identifying and anticipating the ways that abolitionist discourse um gets co-opted and i really also appreciate the way that you sort of centered um like black radical thinking in in this conversation and in inspiring this conversation and the need to sort of continuously center that um so we're just going to transition to a question specifically for leah um, which is what lessons can we as abolitionists learn from the disability justice movement in terms of prioritizing care work and preventing activist burnout? How can we recalibrate our relationships with care work and what shifts both material and ideological does this move demand? I'm gonna fuck with your question. So I actually have a real problem with the way this question was posed because first of all, it's set up in a way that's saying that abolitionists are not disabled and that there's a difference between the abolitionist movement and the disability justice movement. That's a really dangerous and incorrect thing to say. And the first thing I want people to take away from this is that no, don't do that. Disability justice is an abolitionist movement. We are a movement created by black, Asian, and white working class, radical, revolutionary, Maoist, anarchist, communist, disabled people. It is not just the new term for the disability rights movement. We are fundamentally different in our agenda than earlier rights-based, white-dominated, cis male-dominated disability rights. And this really confuses people when we're like, no, you know, we we're about an end to capitalism and colonialism. It's not just like put a brown person in a wheelchair and a Ford ad. Um, so I wanna say that first. And I also wanna say that while this question is well-intended and where, yeah, there are a lot of amazing disabled organizing skills that disability justice organizers have that do work for sustainability and on crip time and out of disabled brilliance, when it's posed that way, it kind of acts like there's the real revolutionaries and then the cripples come in with the rose quartz to give everyone a little self-care session. And mm -mm, no. So um, I am a practical person and I, I wanna win. And I wanna say that the answers that I'm gonna give you having foregrounded that are gonna be different than I think what people think they're gonna be. Because I think a lot of times when this kind of question is posed, it's like, oh, DJ, you know, you guys kind of rest a lot and you move really slow and, you know, nothing ever happens. And I'm like, no, that's not disability justice practice. Like, yeah, when, you know, accessor ride breaks down and someone's two hours late because of structural inaccessibility, we don't start the meeting without them. We're creative in figuring out how they can call in or zoom in. Or I think of one time where this specific crip failure, access failure happened, where we literally, people just were like, there's a bike shop around the corner. Let's go get welding equipment and cut this person out of the van. Like we do all kinds of shit that abled and holistic people would never be able to conceive of, right? So I think the first thing I would say specifically to abled abolitionists is to really know that disabled people are smarter than you are. We're more creative, we're more innovative, we have skills. And I'm not assuming that anyone on this panel is not disabled, but if you are someone who identifies as abled and neurotypical and a revolutionary, know that the handicapped are like 20 steps ahead of you in terms of our strategizing. And it's, it's a both and in terms of we do things that are both, I think, really innovative and technically brilliant in terms of resistance that able radicals don't think of and that they also work towards sustainability. So a couple of examples, and I just threw up something in the chat that if you want to post it, I wrote this article two years ago called Cripping the Resistance During the Uprisings. And it is a really brief 101 in part about different um, disabled radical direct action and other interventions. Um, I want to pull out a couple of different examples. So Carrie Ann Lucas of Blessed Memory, the revolutionary queer Latinx wheelchair, um, wheelchair using femme, fat, disabled organizer and lawyer. Um, so during the fight to save the ADA and Medicaid, which disabled people won, by the way, um, during the Trump administration, um, she was using a power chair that was controlled by one finger on a wire. And she just disconnected it as she was blocking the state senator's office and said, you can Google it. And nobody could move her power chair for something like three days right and she was just like you can yeah um you, you i'm not gonna help you right um i'm thinking about after the pacific so there was a 
situation that happened in 2019, where during the wildfires in California, um, Pacific Gas and Electric, which is the electrical utility company, made this really abrupt announcement in Northern California that they decided to solve the problem by just cutting off power to large swaths of Northern California. And then they were like, oh, do you use a ventilator? Do you need refrigeration for your diabetes medication? You know, it, like, oh, well, there's a number you can call. We'll try and like make sure the power's still on in your house in the block. And of course that didn't happen. And so there was different waves of organizing that came out of it. So the Power to Live Coalition came together and did immensely swift and brilliant and life-saving mutual aid to connect people to, okay, you need to pop, plug in your chair or your ventilator. There's this house in Richmond you can go to and plug in. Um, everything from that to people were doing things like, I figured out how to use dry ice to create a refrigerator for insulin, right? Um, you know, that will work if there's no power. And then, you know, a month after the fact, there was this beautiful, beautiful shutdown of PG&E headquarters that was um, a really huge coalition of climate justice, disabled, elder, um, BIPOC radical, Oakland radical organizations just shut the shit down. And my brilliant comrade, Stacey Park Milburn, who is no longer here, was one of the, who was basically one of the Ella Bakers of DJ before she was murdered two years ago by the state and the medical industrial complex. Um, she was like, girl, we had beds of that action, you know, because she's like, we knew even before COVID that getting disabled people to buy into a direct action where we can be arrested and we're, we might die as disabled BIPOC people if they don't give us our power chair, our meds, whatever. Um, there's a lot of buy-in. So she was just like, we had child care, we had beds, we had food. We used the beds to block like the 13 entrances and exits to PG&E. The cops still do have a hesitation sometimes about beating up people in wheelchairs on camera. They know that mostly no one cares, but that's a really bad look. Um, especially when you can strategically use white disabled allies to be those people, right? Or elderly people. And so I guess the one I want to say is I think that sometimes people think of sustainability as like very soft, as like green tea and meditation. And like, that's great. But it also can be both moving really quickly and with an efficiency of spoons or energy, which we know really well because many of us live with a deficiency of energy. Like I'm chronically ill. I've been sick all my life. I have so many spoons in a week. I have to be really efficient with how I use them. Right. Um, and there's also things like not making access and care this kind of feminized secondary auxiliary part to the struggle, but being like, if we have beds and food and childcare and pleasure and multiple forms of access, more people will actually buy in than, you know, like the 20 able-bodied skinny, you know, young radicals with time on their hands that maybe can show up. Um, it's a truism we always say that it's like, if you move at the rate of the person who walks the slowest, the, no, the largest number of people can join your protests or your action. So I think those are some things. I also want to add, I think that um, especially right now with where we're at in year three of the pandemic and, you know, in a lifetime of anti-Black and Brown police murder and violence and medical violence and murder against disabled BIPOC, we are all in so much grief. And part of the S word of sustainability is actually making room and movements for emotions, grief stewardship, not just like, let's all check in. How are you feeling? Because sometimes I'm like, I don't want to talk about how the fuck I'm feeling. That's how I'm feeling. But I think like similar to what Dylan said about anticipating the co-op, anticipate that people are going to get sick, have a breakdown, need to rotate out and do what you can to, I mean, I think that it's preventative to be like, let's create culture so people can share, well, how the hell are you really feeling? Um, I have a comrade who's part of the Venceremos Brigade that brings people to Cuba, and they were talking about how in bringing American leftists to Cuba, the work they had to do to really be real about like, okay, how are you feeling after, you know, how's, how's your bowel movements? You know, like, are you tired? Like, how's your emotions? Because that's part of collective solidarity. And I was like, right, that's what we in DJ call access intimacy. And access intimacy, the term that was created by Mia Mingus, um, which is meaning that the ability to begin to trust each other with the real deal of our bodies and minds, needs and realities, that's not automatic because for those of us who are BIPOC, we've had to lie about all that shit for our entire lives and say, oh, I'm fine, I don't need anything. And we know there's so many reasons why building a culture of movement over time where we can start to be real about the real deals of our bodies and minds and not just be like, everything's fine until we break. That's not just human. That's not just the future present we want. 
it also creates stronger movements that are built to last. If I can be real at a meeting and be like, I cried for two hours today because Stacy's dead, you know, and not have to suck it up and then break down and then feel ashamed I didn't get my tasks done, that helps me stick around longer. I'm not lost in the movement, right? Um, there's also, you know, there's it's such a disability justice organizing principle to like plan for the fuck up. You know, I always am like, when disabled people run a Zoom, we know something bad's gonna happen and we don't freak out. When able people are doing it for the first time, they're like, oh my God, the captions aren't there. What will we do? And I'm like, we're gonna be five minutes late is what we're gonna do. Cause that is movement building in real life. Similarly, um, and then I'll shut up. I think Katie Tastrom, who's a white disabled radical lawyer in Syracuse, um, she wrote this really good article about, you know, it was like top five or 10 ways, I, I don't have the link, I can find it, um, to make space for chronically ill and disabled people in leadership. And she was like, you know, so much of the time, because we're coming from scarcity and emergency, we're like, one person has the skill, and if they don't do it, we're fucked. One person's supposed to lead the meeting or the action. If we don't, if they can't do it, we're fucked. Whereas DJ's like, we always have backups. Oh, you got in a car accident, you're having a mental breakdown, and you can't do it? Great, we got number two over here. You know, um, I think that that flexibility is really important. I think for me, it's been knowing, I think there's also a real genius of flexibility and disability movement because we're a movement made up of people who've been told that we're not, we can't be the real organizers. We don't have skills. We have nothing to offer because we're too sick or too disabled. And we're a movement of nobodies that's like, we all have something to contribute. So that means that if I can't do it that day, somebody else can. And there's not an assumption that some people are the smart leaders and some people aren't because we think that, you know, Western ableist ideas of intelligence are bullshit. Um, so we're just like, you can break down anything to anybody. You can train anyone in anybody. That's how sustainability happens, where there's not like one charismatic leader. And if they're assassinated or they're targeted, then it's all over. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. There's like so many pieces that I'm like digesting all at once right now. So thank you for all of that. Um, but especially thank you for the correction on that question and kind of the framing of it. Cause I think that gives us a lot to reflect on and to talk about in like our future, um, you know, thinking through of abolition and, trans and transformative justice um, sure. broadly. Um, Real quick, I just want to say there were some links I dropped into the private chat at the beginning that if they haven't been dropped into the public chat yet, it'd be a great time. It's pretty much everything that I listed is either a learn about DJ 101 from Sins and Ballad, Heard, Talila Lewis, and it's also a huge list of disability justice abolitionist projects to check out. Thank, well, you. thank you so much for those. Um, I think Dylan, uh, David just popped them into the chat. Perfect. Um, and so I think just... Um, I know we're we're pretty close to the Q and A, so maybe we'll keep the last question um, pretty pretty short and brief, so we can get to a few questions. But um, um, just really quickly, we wanted to ask both of you. Um, and I guess you've both kind of touched on this in different ways, but we kind of wanted to ask you how we can build community and collective movements through abolition work while, you know, operating within these carceral systems and capitalist societies with limited resources, time, and energy. Um, and what strategies have you seen and used in your own work to build community and to resist the kind of divisive nature of carceral institutions? Um, and I think you've both kind of touched on this, but if you both want to have any kind of final um, thoughts, um, yeah, feel free to, to go ahead. I'll, I'll jump right into it and I'll say these are not final thoughts, mm -hmm. these are working thoughts. And I appreciate this yeah. question a lot. Um, so yeah, so hopefully folks can kind of work with this. And I just want to also just want to repeat what we have just said about how, you know, disability abolitionists have always been at the foundations, at the kind of leadership and intellectual and analytical and practical core of pretty much every abolitionist group organization collective I've been part of. Um, even, even, you know, in the latter 90s, I mean, mm -hmm. this was always the case. It was queer, it was queer identified folks. Um, non-binary folks, feminist folks, et cetera. I was one of the few cisgender men that was actually engaged in some of these collectives. Um, and, one of the, and, and sometimes in the same room, it was, I was one of, I was one of, a, of, a, of a minority of, um, of, of able people in the room. So I, I just wanna just repeat that and say that, that this is a really critical thing to understand about the kind of genealogy, the archive of contemporary, you know, latter 20th and early 21st century abolitionist work is that disability abolitionists have been at the center um, since the start. So in response to your question about building community and collective movements, again, I'll just I'll just try to crystallize some takeaway points. One is that 
I think it's really important. And this is an easy, easier thing to say than to do. Okay. But I think um, all of us need to be really careful about resisting and opposing the tendency to follow an entrepreneurial model with abolitionist organizing work, mm. meaning meaning the constant impulse to grow and get bigger, to centralize, to maybe mm -hmm. consolidate some kind of bureaucratic paradigm for power and authority. Um, you see the problems that this creates, for example, uh, in the antagonism and fallout ongoing within Black Lives Matter that was significantly instigated by the creation of the BLM Global Foundation. I will leave that there. If y'all don't know about that, look it up, right? But but it's, it's really created a serious set of antagonisms. Um, further, the entrepreneurial model of organizing which, which I'll say the great Robert Allen wrote about and anticipated in his, you know, I think a required reading for all activists in this period, um, Black Awakening in Capitalist America. He was writing about this in real time in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. but, but what he saw and what, what I just want to emphasize is how the entrepreneurial approach to organizing and to radicalism tends to rely on a definition of resources that really means money. Mm -hmm. That's what it really means, right? And in Abel this work, if you look at the long archive, it has always understood resources in very different ways than that. Okay. But if you fall into an entrepreneurial model, then 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 you think about resources almost always as, as money or some form of you know kind of capital, which then translates to some combination of, of mobilizing your work around appealing to philanthropic foundation and corporate money with maybe a sprinkle of grassroots money. And the problem is that shit turns into grift way too quickly, sometimes before you even realize it's turned into grift, um, meaning kind of fundamental dishonesty. Okay, so that's one thing. Refuse the entrepreneurial model. The second point, um, in a constructive way, creative way, maybe rather than an entrepreneurial model, we, we can continue to think about following a translated and experimental guerrilla model, right? Guerrilla model, meaning... meaning in part, an embrace of things like strategic retreat, mm -hmm. right? Um, collective principle mm -hmm. adherence to the principle of rest, mm -hmm. meaning hiatus, right? That 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 you don't sustain community and collective movements by constantly adhering to you know the the uh, the, the the 20th century civilizational imperative of the Anglo-Saxon Protestant work ethic, right? By grinding yourself into dust making yourself unhealthy, and then reproducing all of the asymmetries of power that Leo was just talking about, which those those tendencies in the kind of so-called work ethic of so many movements, they always, they always punish disabled people, working class and poor people, unhoused people, food insecure people, and others, okay? So a guerrilla model means that you have a constant analysis and diagnosis of, of my third point, which is, transparency of shared and unshared vulnerabilities hmm. within our communities and movements right so in a way we've been talking about this the whole time right so i'm and so i think certainly the the, the unshared vulnerabilities across the spectrum of disability and and able and able people right that's a clear one but but we're also thinking about the specificity of things like anti-black like anti-blackness anti-black policing for example right the specificity of things like colonial occupation and the kind of settler relationship so those things are unshared and i think there's a need for transparency in the communities that we participate in around those things which which i think is so crucial because it resists what i think is the front and back door liberal humanist impulse to universalize every fucking thing hmm including in abolitionist communities is to there's a liberal humanist impulse which is grounded in, in in you know civilizational colonial white supremacy to universalize pain suffering and vulnerability to try to make it accessible to everybody but right? that, that's that's where this um the rise of, of this kind of white fragility how to be an anti-racist industry has mm -hmm. popped off where you can buy that shit at target and walmart now but right? it's become a kind of therapeutic industrialization that that has on top and beneath it, this very liberal, this this exact liberal humanist impulse that I'm talking about. Um, the last thing I'll say, uh, the fourth point, um, in, in kind of building these forms of community and movement, I think some some really key things that I think I think a lot of us probably do anyways, but we don't frame it in the terms that y'all's question did. Okay, collective study. Mm -hmm. Collective study is critical to everything. Mm -hmm. Right, resist the so-called. I don't like to call it necessarily anti-intellectualism. Oh, that's what it is. But mm -hmm. but the resistance to study, 
right? And I'm not saying necessarily just book reading or you know article reading, but 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 screening films together, listening to music together, collective study, collective thinking, um, you know, collective practices of creativity, including art, right? Mm -hmm. Even those of us who don't don't identify as artists, right? We can engage in those practices mm -hmm. with our with our artists, friends, and experts. Um, mm -hmm caretaking, cooking and food sharing, play, right? All those things uh, to me are really foundational uh, to not only building community and collective movements, but to making them sustainable because people want to be part of them, right? So all those things need to be part of it. All those things need to be engaged with, with uh, the praxis of abolition as human beings. Mm -hmm. What he said, um, it's, I wanna make room for questions. I think that I might've already spoken to some of this, but. I will, I know famous last words, briefly say, um, I just want to say again, I think that, I mean, I'm with everything Dylan said about like, we really have to know it's a trap and a trick where they're like, oh, let's give you a million dollars, you know? And I also just, I want to just say that it's real that people are like, we have no fucking money and we need some. And I think having those conversations with people in movement spaces, like currently, where there's people I respect who are like, all money's dirty. And I was like, yeah, and we still have choices about what we take and what the cost of taking it is. And I do think there can be a cost of, like, I mean, in my bio, it's like, you know, they're a 2020 Disability Futures Fellow. And, you know, that's a fellowship. It's the only big fellowship I've ever gotten in my life because I'm not inside academia or in PIC. And it's, you know, it's through U.S. artists, which is a pretty awesome, in a lot of ways, arts foundation. But half of it was Ford Foundation money. And I don't know if people know that when we, like, the reason why we were like, okay, maybe strategically we take this and we redistribute it. But there were so many panicked conference or angry and, you know, furious conference calls, you know, between all of us as comrades who were like, we might, do we take this? Do we not take this? And we were all like, what we have to lose is our relationships with each other. What we have to lose is, ooh, only 50 of us get it, and then some people don't. And we made a strategic discuss, um, you know, we made a strategic agreement where we're like, okay, we're gonna take this because we were like, if we don't take it, they will give it to white liberal disabled people, and we are people who are more likely to redistribute it, share it for projects, survive, etc. But and we're like, we're also gonna keep, I mean, when they were like, do you wanna get interviewed by the Seattle Times? I was like, yeah, I'm gonna use this to talk about what Ford has done to destabilize like every movement that they then find out, oh my God, you're anti-Zionist? No way, well, we're gonna pull all the money, right? Which is, you know, otherwise known as why Insight stopped having big national conferences because after the third one, Ford was like, oh shit, you don't like Israel. We're gonna take all the money away. And then it was a destabilizing moment around there is, you know, something to be gotten out of having the money to bring together a big North American wide gathering. And when that gets taken away, how does that slow us down, make us have to pivot really hard? We've gotten used to that in terms of how we're going to build, right? It's just things to think about. Um, but I guess the TLDR is I don't want to shame anyone for being like, yo, I'm broken. I need resources. And I think as a movement, we need to actually be real about what we can and cannot do in terms of the resources we can collectively generate, whether it's money or care or child care or housing takeovers or all of it. You know, we need to be able to give people a real alternative because um, that material read is, read is that material need is real. The other thing I just wanted to say is that I think that we regain a lot of our resources when we stop trying to, you know, rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic and, you know, fix the cops. And last two quick things, sorry. Um, you know, one thing that has been a foundational part of disability justice since the beginning has been a refusal of the project that of, of us being like, no, we're not gonna do little workshops, little sensitivity workshops with the cops to make them not shoot us. Like we give up, the cops are designed to shoot us, no. Um, and that there's an energy that's reclaimed and we're like, no, we're not gonna try and fix a system that's designed to kill us. We're gonna do something else with our energy. That's number one. Um, yeah, that might be number one and two, but just like, don't try and fix it, create something different. Um, see what's possible through partnership. Like, I want to say that I just did an interview with Kibo Drew, K-E-B-O-D-R-E-W, of the Queer Women of Color Media Arts Project, which is a Black and Asian-led radical queer media organization. And I was like, 
how do you do all this DJ as a very working class led, you know, black, Asian, queer organization? And she's like, well, yeah, all of our shit's captioned. All of our shit has ASL. All of our shit has food. We don't necessarily have that money, but we're like, who do we partner with who can? Where can we get can we get the food donated and then we free up that money to pay the interpreter? Stuff like that. And she's like, we're always saying if we can't do it, we can do A, we can do something. B, who else can we build with who can do something? And last but not least, I threw in the link. Um, please check out Dr. Shami Sami Shuck's Black Disability politics, Black Disability Politics, which is coming out this fall. She has an incredible analysis and has dug up so much history about um, the Black Panther Party's disability politics and Black radical disability politics in the 60s, 70s, and 80s in North America. Um, super crucial, especially around AIDS, IV drug use, and care. Yeah. Thank you so much for all your insights and really like complexly thinking about like what we mean by resources and how we actually deal with the material realities of like living and then also like fighting for these like more yeah. abolitionist like just features. Um, we do have a few questions already in the chat, so I'm just gonna read them off real quick. Um, so there's two questions from Amanda um, for Leah. Would you be able to share some practical steps for starting a people's ambulance? And um, the second one for Dylan, how do you personally balance being an academic and an abolitionist? I'm about to be on the job market in a year, and I honestly have no clue how to find a job and be an outward radical. I'm going to speak to Amanda. Um, no, I'm not qualified, but there might have already been posted, but I would really go to the people who are the experts, which are the people who are doing it. So people's, Met, uh, people's medics, rep, um, trans, like, and there's different kinds of people with ambulances, right? So I would also check out Trans Lifeline. Um, the Anti-Police Terror Project has their alternative to 911 hotline. Um, in Beyond Survival, which is a Jerison Mines book, we printed a whole guide that Oakland Power Projects did around, you know, that was partly drawing on people's medic stuff around, here's how you stop an overdose. Here's how you stop a gunshot wound. Like, here's how you check in with someone who's having a panic attack or in an altered state in the street. So I would go there first. Um, there's a lot of material out there in those projects, in the project, I believe that Dylan mentioned, um, for people who are, you know, creating their own clinics and their own emergency response systems. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I'll be really quick because um, Amanda, I know Amanda, we're comrades in the Cops Off Campus chapter here in the Inland Empire and Riverside. Amanda is somebody I actually really look up to. They're a grad student at UCR, but I really do look up to them because of their organizing work with Riverside Food Not Bombs. In many ways, um, and I know people don't know Amanda necessarily here, but Amanda's actually already exemplifying uh, the necessary lack of balance, the, you know, the impossibility of a balance between those two positions, between so-called academic and, and organizer activists. But, but I will just kind of crystallize my position on this by um by once again quoting my my teacher um my, my teacher angela davis who i came to with this question years and years and years ago and who just kind of looked at me and said well you know you need to understand your activism you're organizing all this trouble that you get yourself involved in purpose involved with so purposefully you need to understand that as your research right mm -hmm. you need to understand and, and then, you know it's exactly what i always wanted somebody to fucking tell me but nobody would say that to me and authorize it and then when angela said i was like all right fuck the rest i can angela just angela just legitimated this and i feel like that's what um that's one strategy amanda it's not the definitive one there's no you know academia is um an inherently toxic and unhealthy place it's um like many other places of work so i'm not going to say that there's actually a way to balance this i'm not going to give you a happy ending to that but you already knew that most of you probably do I'm also going to say as a grad school, well, I didn't drop out of grad school, but I dropped out of academia. You can go your own way and there's many ways to fly. If you want to intervene by being in academia and it works for you, great. And also just know that you can be a fuck up and leave. You know, I I really call on what Alexis Pauline Gums, she, there was, I was like, should I apply for this one academic job? And she's like, you know, I'm an academic abolitionist. And I was like, I know you are. I know you are Twin Portal. So, and I want to lift up that there's ways to be a radical, like Jim Campbell, who I shouted out, um, who's passed now, but was, you know, one of the first prison abolitionists in Canada I met. He worked as a meter reader. You know, he's like, I got a union job reading meters. And then I ran this, like, who ran this revolutionary prison justice paper out of my basement. You know, there's like, and I mean, that's an 80s, 90s strategy. You know, I'm not saying that everyone can go out and get a white man union job now, right? But just know that like we can be creative in how we resource ourselves and how we spend our time and energy as radicals and it can shift throughout your lifetime. 
I, I will also just add to 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 the point that that of Amanda's question that um, if you're situated in a university, especially a death dealing colonial one like the University of California, I actually think you have if if you're if you call yourself if you identify yourself as somebody with um, that's engaged in abolitionist practices and communities, you actually have an obligation to create severe antagonism mm -hmm. um, to you know be be as disruptive and collectively disruptive as possible within that particular institution. Uh, I think I think that 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 you know it doesn't take that much analysis or historical understanding to to know that the research university really pretty much any institution of higher education um they have collectively played a central role in constituting you know the colonial ableist patriarchal misogynist transphobic you know anti-black apparatus of civilization and so and so to be to be inhabiting a position within those places means that you actually may be able to strategically disrupt um and disrupt them and create you know logics of of destruction that erode those things and ultimately um i think catalyze other forms of abolitionist creativity that you know you may or may not be able to house within the academic or university site mm -hmm. So unfortunately, we are at um, 1 p.m., so we are kind of the end of our discussion. Um, but I want to really thank both Leah and Dylan for taking the time to be in this panel today and also for each of your really deep and thoughtful insights on abolition, um, transformative and disability justice. Um, and then before we conclude this panel, um, we just want to spotlight um, the next event in the series, um, as well as our creative submissions. Um, so the next talk in the Just Future series um, will feature Kai Ching Tom, yeah. um, and will be yeah, and will be um, actually an in-person event um, on March um, 21st um, from 5 to 6:30 um, at UBC's Green College, um, which is really exciting. Um, and we'd also like to remind everyone that we are accepting creative submissions until April 18th, um, which respond to the series themes of abolition and transformative justice. Um, and you can find more details um, on our website, which is justfeaturesubc.wordpress.com. Um, and you can also follow us on our Facebook page um, to get the latest updates on the series um, and upcoming events, um, which we've just linked um, below. Um, and then finally, I'd just like to thank my co-panelist Elena, as well as like everyone in the GSA who's really been pulling the series together. Um, we really hope we can see everyone at the next talk. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. And yeah, have a great Monday. Thank you all so much. This is amazing. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. much.